What's going on guys? Ben Brewster here with TreadAthletics.com. It's been a wild last week. I know lots of you guys emailed in. A lot of our remote athletes have been texting us, blowing up our phones, trying to figure out what to do during this downtime where they don't have access to a facility to train at. So, um, you know, without further ado, I wanted to make a video, kind of clear the air, give you guys some stuff that you could still do to get a training effect while you're at home. Maybe you have to work out in a parking lot, work out in your bedroom, whatever you have to do. There's still a lot of things that you can do with body weight, with a partner, um, with some very basic uh, tools that you, you're gonna have at your disposal. So I'm gonna kinda go through those today, show you how you can build a workout. And then we're actually gonna have a PDF you guys can download just to get kind of a sample temporary workout that you guys can do and take from this. Um, you know, for the foreseeable future. So, um, you know, we did a poll on social media asking people if this is what they wanted. And overwhelming majority of guys, um, you know, said they didn't, weren't exactly clear on how they could continue training during this time. So, um, without further ado, let's get into the video. So, the first question that I want to address is, will, will I lose muscle during this downtime? And the answer is assuming that this is kind of a two to six week process or period where you're not gonna have access to a facility, not really. Um, the, the residual effect of, uh, you know, when, when it comes to absolute strength, when it comes to hypertrophy, uh, the training residuals are quite long. So it actually takes quite a bit of time to see a noticeable decrease in muscle mass and in absolute strength. So for most of you guys, if you can continue getting somewhat of a training effect here during this initial period, uh, you shouldn't have to worry too much about losing any maximal strength or losing any muscle size. Now, again, if you completely do nothing for the next six or eight weeks, that will be the, the case, but there is such a thing as muscle memory uh, from a biological standpoint where it is significantly easier to regain strength once you've lost it. So let's say you do lose five pounds here and you lose 10% off all your strength numbers, but then you get back to training in eight weeks from now and you have a couple of good weeks in the gym it comes back very, very quickly. So uh, most people that have been training for five or 10 years understand this and have had this experience, uh, but it does come back quickly. And most of you shouldn't have to worry about this in the first place because I'm about to show you exactly what you need to do to maintain your strength in the meantime. So don't worry too much about losing muscle in this interim phase. So let's go first over some general programming principles to kind of give some context to the exercises that I'm gonna show you because it's not just about randomly throwing exercises together, it's about having some sort of general process, and some sort of logical process with how you program certain exercises, certain movements, um, how you incorporate those in a program. So I'll take care of this with a PDF for you guys to download, but I just wanna give you some background on, on why we're doing what we're doing. So the first thing is there's a couple different ways to lay this out. Uh, right now, most of you guys aren't in season, you're not competing, so we can treat this as kind of a mini off-season phase. Now, I'm assuming you're still gonna be able to throw in kind of a higher in-season uh, volume as far as, you know, maybe bullpens, wherever you have to do for, from a throwing standpoint, you're still gonna be doing that. But we can, again, treat this as a little bit of a, a mini off-season phase where you don't have to worry about being 100% fresh for your throwing sessions because we're not in games right now. So that being said, the options are really a three-day split or a four-day split. Now a four day split, it's gonna be two upper body days and two lower body days. And a three day split, it's generally gonna be either three total body days or an upper, a lower, and a combined total body day. Either way, the common theme is that you're hitting each major muscle group in your body twice per week. So that's the common theme. Again, there's multiple ways to kind of divide it up. Um, but let's, let's say we're talking about the quads. You're gonna be doing some sort of quad type movement twice per week um, to stimulate sufficient hypertrophy, strength, power development, whatever the case, whatever the case may be, whatever you're work, you happen to be working on right now in your training. So um, that's just generally how these are gonna be laid out. Um, for beginners versus more advanced, like for the, the professional guy that's watching this that has a very good strength base, a lot of this is gonna be more focused towards kind of power development. And I would place more emphasis on the power exercises that I'm gonna show you, the power variations. Whereas a lot of these beginner athletes, some of the remote guys that we've been working with, they've been spending a lot of this off season working on building that general strength base because it does take several years to really build up that initial base to where you can apply a large amount of force. And then from there, it becomes much more about just maintaining that strength level and being able to apply that force as quickly as possible. So given what I'm saying, I'm gonna have a PDF download, but it's gonna be uh, necessary to kind of tweak that based on your specific case. More advanced guys do more power variations here and the, the younger, maybe less advanced guys do more of the strength based stuff here. That being said, let's talk real quick about different ways to progress exercises. So 
A lot of people think that resistance, adding resistance is the only way to increase the difficulty of an exercise, but that's simply not true. So there are still a number of tools in our toolbox that we can use while you don't have access to a facility. So besides just adding resistance and being able to put 300 pounds on a bar, there's still a lot of ways that we can progress something. The first way that we can progress an exercise is playing with the uh, type of contraction or the tempo of the movement. The main different ways of that being emphasizing the eccentric or the lowering phase of the movement. So this would be doing a slow lowering on a squat or a slow lowering on a push up or a bench press or something like that. And that's gonna make the, obviously make the exercise more difficult by taking some of that stretch reflex out of it by giving you more time under tension. Uh, the other way we can do this is with isometrics or pause reps. So maybe you're doing a squat, you get to the very bottom of the movement and we pause, you do a hold for three seconds or you get to the bottom of a split squat and you hold for three seconds or the bottom of a push up and you hold for three seconds. So adding isometrics and playing with that tempo of the movement can be another way to make the exercise more difficult without having to add a ton of external load. Then the final way to progress or change up an exercise um, that I'm going to talk about here is reactivity. So doing exercises uh, in a kind of a reactive fashion where the idea is to change direction very quickly to be able to absorb that eccentric uh, transition through the isometric and explode through the push-up or squat or whatever movement you're doing. Uh, so again, there's different ways that we can play with that type of contraction or the tempo of the movement. We can play with the strength curve. So if you have bands laying around or, or chains, most of you might not have chains laying around, but if you have bands and you add that to, let's say, a push-up, you just change the strength curve of the movement. So instead of it just being your body weight through the whole movement, now as you get stronger towards the top of the movement, you're in a more advantageous position of leverage. Now the band begins to give you more resistance and you have that resistance towards that top end of the strength curve. So it closely, the resistance matches the strength curve more closely. So if you have bands, that's one way we can add resistance and change up the difficulty of the exercise. Um, obviously we can change from bilateral exercises to more unilateral. So Obviously, if you have 200 pounds and you do a bodyweight squat, that's 200 pounds spread between both of your legs. But if you do a lunge, you're gonna be able to take advantage of not having as much load available. You might only need a backpack with 50 pounds in it if you're doing certain lunge variations that I'm gonna show you. So we can switch from bilateral exercises to more unilateral to kind of take advantage of not having a ton of external load available just laying around your house. Um, from there, obviously increasing volume, increasing the number of sets or reps that you do is another way to increase or progress an exercise. Uh, increasing the range of motion, so doing deeper squats with holds, uh, deeper lunges, extended range of motion push-ups. We can really play with the range of motion of exercises to increase the intensity or, or progress in exercise as well. And then the final way is mind-muscle connection. So as you're going through some of these exercises, you might not have a ton of weight, but really focusing on the mind-muscle connection, focusing on squeezing the muscles that you're working on contracting and really activating those muscles through the entire range of motion and through the entire movement. And they've shown that that actually does increase muscular activation if you have that active focus of, let's say on your push-up, that active focus on the pecs or, or using your upper back muscles to squeeze and contract into the movement and then firing and really focusing on feeling the pec fire. So they've shown that that does increase muscle activity to be able to really focus on the mind-muscle connection. And a lot of times if you don't have a ton of extra weight, but you do really focus on the tension that you're creating. So again, those are the main ways that we're gonna, kind of the main variables that we're gonna play with here. And I have, a, again, a whole list of movements and exercises that we're gonna go through. So um, let's now transition to that. All right, so when building a program, what are the main types of movements that we need? Here's how I break it up in most of the programs that we write. So for lower body to start, we're gonna want some sort of hip dominant movement. This would be like an RDL or deadlift or glute ham raise. Those are examples of hip dominant movements where it's more glute, posterior chain, hamstring, uh, driving, the, driving the movement. Uh, we're also gonna want quad dominant movements. So these, are, these are things like squats, lunges, something where it's much more of a quad focused movement. Uh, lateral movement, so some sort of lateral lunge or something that engages the lateral lines in the body, the lateral lower half. Uh, TFL, glute med, um, all sorts of these different exercises. So something basically working in each plane and working different aspects of the lower half. For upper body, we're looking at just a primary push and a primary pull. So push being like a push up or a single arm cable press and pull obviously being some sort of rowing variation, chin up variation, something like that. Uh, we look at arm care. I like to have some sort of general serratus anterior movement, some sort of lower trap movement, and then some sort of posterior cuff movement. Um, we'll get into that as, as we go on. And then for core, typically some sort of anterior core, some sort of rotational core movement, and some sort of lateral core movement. So as you can see, basically trying to get a well-rounded balance of exercises that work all the muscles in the body in different planes of motion. So those are kind of the basics that we'll build the program around. 
And now I wanna take you through each of those and give you kind of different variations, whether you just have body weight, maybe you have access to a partner, and we'll kind of go through some of the pros and cons and overlay videos of these so that you can see what I'm talking about. All right, so let's start with hip dominant exercises. Here's some good options that you can try. The first is to do a single leg or a bilateral uh, leg curl. Um, you can either do this with an office chair, something that rolls that you can put your feet up on, and you can do either two leg or even more advanced would be a single leg version. So again, depending on what floor surface, that might be very challenging with a single leg or it might be fairly easy for some of you with single leg. But again, that would be a good, a good option if you don't have a rolling office chair to kind of use instead of a yoga ball or a physio ball. And you can actually do this with your socks or maybe even like a pair of sweatpants on a wooden floor so it slides and you can do them that way as well. So leg curls are a great option. You can actually do this in a tri-set or a quad set where you descend from uh, single leg to two leg to then hip bridges to then hip bridges from your toes. So a lot of ways to make that a very challenging exercise that you can do from your home. All right, the next hip dominant exercise is more of a plyometric or power exercise and that would be some sort of broad jump. So you can either do a broad jump upstairs or you can do just flat broad jump uh, you know, on, outside on the floor or outside on the grass. Um, but again, this is just a good hip dominant plyometric movement that you can incorporate. Uh, I like to actually superset this with whatever your strength movement is. So let's say you're doing the, the leg curls from the previous exercise, you can actually superset a power movement of a similar uh, type of movement with the strength movement. So this is called doing a contrast set. So do the strength movement, then do the equivalent power movement immediately after that. Uh, it's kind of a potentiation for that power movement. So hitting those muscles in kind of a higher intensity strength movement and then taking that uh, activation of those muscles, if you want to call it that, to a power movement is a good way to kind of work on both components of that uh, force velocity profile. Moving on to quad dominant movements that you can do from home, uh, there's quite a few that can still give you a good training effect. So we talked about moving from bilateral movements to more unilateral movements to be able to kind of take advantage of more resistance per limb. So my favorite here is the Bulgarian split squat. Now you can progress this in a number of different ways, make it more challenging. Um, first off, as far as adding external load, if you don't have like 10 or 20 pound dumbbells laying around the house, what you can actually do is take a backpack fill it with water bottles, fill it with soup cans, fill it with whatever you need to get a 40 or 50 or 60 pound uh, weight vest essentially. So that's a good way first off to make it moderately more challenging from the start. And then from there you can play with adding slow eccentrics or adding pauses or isometric holds at the bottom. Uh, this is actually a great movement to do isometrics with where you can do upwards of 30 to 60 second holds at the bottom. Again, it's a good exercise to train that bottom position. It's a good one to open up the hip flexors on the trail leg. Um, and create a little bit of that single leg stability. So a bunch of different variations you can do for Bulgarian split squats uh, using a backpack, slow eccentrics, or isometrics. Uh, turning that into more of a power movement, you can actually alternate your strength sets with the Bulgarian split squats, take all the weight off, and then do them reactively. So pull yourself down into the hole and then explode as fast as you can as soon as you hit the ground. Uh, so that's another, another way, basically way to uh, work on tr doing contrast sets with the Bulgarian split squats. Uh, as far as two, two other exercises that I think are very good options here, uh, one is high step downs. So you're going to need a high box or maybe your counter or maybe a high desk. Um, but essentially it's just a single leg squat where you're stepping all the way down. I really like these because there's a huge focus on ankle mobility, on range of motion. And again, it's still using your entire body weight. So 200 pounds, uh, you're still putting all 200 pounds on that one leg and getting very, very deep getting a full stretch on the glutes, the hamstrings, the quads. So uh, good progression. And then it's very easy to load this because you only need maybe 10 pounds per hand. It becomes very, very challenging. Um, so step downs are a great one. And then pistol squat variations as well. So all you need is a couch, a chair, something to squat down to. And then from there, again, you don't need much weight at all. You can use the backpack as we talked about with 20, 30, 40, 50 pounds loaded in it. You can use a couple five pound plates held out in front of you as a counterbalance. But this is again, a very advanced exercise. You don't need a ton of external load to make it challenging. All right, moving on to lateral movements that you can do from home. Uh, the first one that I really like is the Cossack lunge. So basically it's like a goblet lateral lunge, but you're going extremely low on the movement. So there's emphasis on getting a good stretch through your groin, through your adductors, and really controlling the movement through that entire range. This is very important for throwers in general, 
We tend to have very tight, wound up adductors in the first place. Um, but again, it's still a good strength movement and it still incorporates the lateral lines of your body um, as you go into the movement. So the Cossack lunge, you can make that more advanced by adding weight in the form of a back, weighted backpack, water bottles, you know, like we already talked about. You can add a slow eccentric, you can add an isometric pause at the bottom. So a couple of different ways to make that more challenging. And then if you do have a partner, uh, something that I really like is a uh, manual resisted hip abduction. So I'll put a video up showing what that looks like. Um, but again, that's another way to incorporate uh, glute med training and incorporate strengthening of the lateral hip musculature, which very, very uh, useful and incorporated in throwing motion. So being strong in that frontal plane is very important as well. Now, as far as power movements that you can do in the frontal plane, uh, any sort of lateral jump is going to be a good option. So whether we're talking about lateral hydens or medial to lateral jumps or, uh, you know, continuous lateral jumps, uh, there's a couple different options that I'm going to throw up here and put in that PDF for you guys to download. All right, moving on to pushing exercises or pressing exercises. Uh, we're all familiar with push-ups. This is kind of the bread and butter movement that you're gonna be able to do from anywhere, even if you don't have access to a training facility. So um, first off, just basic weighted push-ups, load up a backpack, use that as a weighted vest, and again, use that to overload your push-ups and make them a little bit more challenging. If you don't have access to that, you can also go ahead and do assisted single arm push-ups. So I really, really like these because you can basically just bias a lot of weight towards one arm and you're just using the off arm for stability. So if you don't believe me, go ahead and take a weight scale from your bathroom and do a set of these and you'll see you're putting a ton of that weight on one single arm at a time, way more than you'd be able to do if you just put two arms on the scale and divided that in half. So you're really able to get a good strength workout there, a good strength pressing exercise by just doing assisted single arm work. As far as power pressing movements that you can do, uh, bar power push-ups are a really great option. Uh, because again, you can lighten the load and do it. Uh, you can basically superset your heavy sets with push-ups with a much lighter set done for speed. So on the bar push-ups, really think about pulling yourself down into the hole and then reversing the direction of that as fast as you possibly can and throwing yourself off the bar. Um, so really good to do those kind of paired with, paired with each other as kind of a contrast set. Um, medicine ball passes are great if you have access to a medicine ball, if you have a place to go outside, your backyard, whatever, and do that. Um, I'm assuming most of you won't, won't be able to necessarily do that. And then valve side push-ups are another great option, another way to basically bias a single arm type push-up and put more of that weight on one arm at a time. So basically just take a sock or a pair of sweatpants or something that slides on a wooden floor. And then again, your off arm is kind of the support arm, the, the arm that moves um, while the main arm is handling much more low than you would in a regular body weight push-up. So those are kind of the main pressing variations. If you do have a partner, if you're working out with a buddy, then you can just do manual resistance push-ups, have him basically apply force down on your back and give a little bit more on the eccentric, on the negative phase of the movement and a little bit less on the positive. Um, but again, that's kind of the obvious way if you do have a partner. All right, moving on through this to pulling exercises. Uh, this is one that's kind of tough to do on your own. There's relatively limited options if you don't really have a ton of equipment. Um, I will say that if you have a band um, that you can kind of attach to something, attach to a pole and do band cable rows, that's a good option. If you have uh, one of those doorway chin-up bars, that's a really good option for vertical pulling. You can do pull-ups, chin-up variations in your doorway. And you can also hang straps, TRX straps or suspension straps from that pull-up bar and do all sorts of single arm rows or body weight inverted rows from the doorway pull-up bar. But again, I'm guessing a lot of you guys don't have that. So I'm gonna show you a partner variation that you can do, low rows, manual low rows. So I'm gonna show you guys how to do that as well. Um, but again, two good variations that you can do if you do have a buddy uh, to get you through this workout. When it comes to some sort of core movement, uh, for anterior core movements, I like more advanced plank variations. So you can lengthen the lever arm on the plank uh, to make it a little more, more challenging. Uh, make sure as you do this, you're not feeling it in the low back and you posteriorly tilt the pelvis, squeeze the glutes and brace the abs hard. Um, if you again, do the more advanced plank variations, you can add weight on your back to make the planks more advanced. Um, or you can also do uh, body saws. So using your socks sliding on a wooden floor, um, Go ahead, go through a body saw. It's already a very advanced exercise uh, that you can really much, really pretty much do anywhere that you want. Um, so planks and body saws. 
As far as a rotational core movement, uh, renegade rows are kind of a go-to that you can do. If you don't have dumbbells to do the renegade rows, then you can just do uh, alternating uh, plank holds basically, where you lift one arm off the ground at a time and it becomes basically a, a rotary or an anti-rotation core movement um, that incorporates a little bit more obliques uh, into that movement to resist rotation uh, at the pelvis and torso. And then finally, uh, lateral core movements that, are, that would be a good recommendation, a good option here to do from home uh, would be adductor side planks. So this is kind of a combination side plank and Copenhagen exercise where you are getting some isometric activation of your adductors. Again, very, very important for rotational athletes, for throwers, um, but it's still incorporating the lateral core musculature um, and it's still sufficiently challenging um, for the sake of this home workout. So those are some good core movements uh, that I would explore in these, uh, in these workouts. As far as arm care, again, we're dividing it up into serratus work, low trap work, posterior cuff work, and then I'm gonna put some forearm isolation work in there as well. Uh, for serratus work, wall slides are gonna be your best bet here. You, again, you can do this from home, you can do this anywhere, just need something that can slide against the wall. So uh, again, those are very good option for serratus work. As far as the low trap, if you're working out by yourself, uh, prone Y and T raises are gonna be your best bet. You can use whatever you've got available from two pound dumbbell to a soup can to uh, a water bottle, uh, whatever you've got, um, you can add iso holds here, you can add slow eccentrics, um, you can also do oscillating reps. So turn it into a little bit more of a reactive movement as well uh, at the very top end of that movement. So a lot of different options you can do with just your basic prone Y and T raises. Uh, if you do have a partner to work out with, then you can actually add some manuals here. So you can do kind of a diagonal D2 uh, or Y pattern uh, manual where you add a little bit of overload to the eccentric. So a little bit more resistance on the way down, and a little bit less on the way up. Uh, for the manuals, uh, one thing to be aware of is that you do want to make sure you're, at, you're properly matching the strength, the, the resistance to the strength curve. So don't just press straight down on their arm as they're going through that movement or have your buddy press straight down on your arm. The resistance should follow the curve of the movement. So it's the resistance changes in, in regards to the arc that you're going through in the movement. So it should be perpendicular to the movement. So if you're going through a D, uh, D2 pattern, the resistance isn't just straight forward or straight down the whole time. The resistance from your buddy should follow the arc of the movement as you're going through it. From there, you can obviously do T raises. You can do different, uh, different patterns with manual resistance um, as, as you would in your normal arm care. So from a face pull or a T raise or a Y raise or an A pattern, all of these can be done with manual resistance. As far as posterior cuff, uh, again, you're kind of limited if you don't have bands or dumbbells, um, but you can do isometrics. So you can do doorway isos. Just make sure you stabilize the humeral head in the socket, get up to 90 degrees of abduction, 90 degrees at the elbow, and you can do external rotations at your end range into a doorway. So just a, in general, a very good uh, posterior cuff activation exercise, but you can turn it into a little bit more of a strength exercise by doing slightly longer duration, slightly higher intensity isometrics. If you do have a 10 pound dumbbell laying around, you can do sideline dumbbell externals. Um, that's a good option as well. All right, and some other miscellaneous shoulder exercises that you can play with are clappers or manual external rotations. So if you do have a buddy, he can help you with doing kind of these oscillate, oscillatory uh, rotator cuff movements that we call clappers. Uh, you can also do manual resisted side laying external rotations or uh, half kneeling external rotations as well. Uh, rhythmic stabilizations are just another good exercise if you do have a buddy. So go ahead and check out our three-way rhythmic stabilization series as well. When it comes to forearm isometrics or just forearm exercises in general, uh, depending on what you have, there's a couple of different ways to do this. But in general, we're basically looking at doing some sort of six-way forearm series. So again, we're looking at uh, wrist flexion, wrist extension, uh, forearm pronation, forearm supination, radial deviation, and ulnar deviation. So six-way forearms. And you can do this a couple of different ways. If you have a band, uh, that's an easy way to do that. We'll show you all those different movements here. Uh, down below on the video. If you have a, uh, some sort of like baseball bat or stick or something that you can hold in each hand, you can actually do manual forms yourself. Now this is a little bit more uh, in depth, so we're gonna link to a more detailed video on how to do that in the description. Um, but again, you can do manual forms where you are working out one form at a time and using the other arm, the other hand to provide that resistance. So again, a little bit more technical, but uh, manual forms are possible by yourself. Manual forms are also possible if you have a partner. So. Uh, Again, if you're doing this with a buddy, very easy way to get uh, 
good form strengthening through that entire range of motion on all six of those movements that we covered. Um, so again, this is just an overview of a bunch of different exercises that you can do from home, kind of broken apart by if you have to do them solo or if you have a buddy available. Um, these aren't the only ex exercises that work that you can do, but this should give you a pretty well-rounded uh, way of training your body to maintain strength, maintain power output in this interim. All right, so by now we've gone over what are the exercises that you can do at home and still get a training effect. But bear with me for a couple more minutes because I have a couple more points to make for how you can make the most of this time and kind of turn this into a positive uh, if, you're, if you're forced to train at home or don't have access to a training facility. Uh, so the first point is mobility work. A lot of guys that we work with uh, have a ton of mobility issues that they're, they're working on addressing at any one time. So in a sense, this is something that you can really do from anywhere and use this as a time to really refocus on attacking these specific mobility deficiencies. So uh, a lot of these exercises require just a lacrosse ball or a tennis ball or a foam roller or a partner or just your thumb, whatever the case may be. Um, these are exercises for the most part that you can do from anywhere. Um, so you, again, take advantage of this opportunity and maybe some of the downtime you might have and really refocus on your mobility. Ask yourself, um, I'm assuming you have gotten an assessment, but assuming you know what your deficiencies are, what your issues are, um, kind of map out a plan for what you're gonna do over these next two, three, four, six weeks, however long you don't have access to a facility, um, and really make the most of this time from a mobility standpoint, because a lot of guys, their limiting factor on that lowest hanging fruit isn't necessarily their strength. If they lost 5% strength in the next few weeks, it wouldn't kill them, but if they gained 5% on their mobility, that would be a huge benefit. Um, so just understand that is a huge piece of the equation for a lot of you guys watching this video. Uh, and then finally, tissue areas that, that you really should uh, kind of refocus on and make sure that you're taking care of. Um, a lot of the common areas that we see, TFL, glute med, uh, the adductor complex, addu adductor magnus specifically can get really tight, gritty, nasty in a lot of throwers. Uh, psoas, uh, pec minor, subclavius, uh, lat and subscap get really gritty, really, really nasty in a lot of throwers that we see. Uh, tricep, especially the long head of the tricep, can really limit shoulder flexion, create shoulder pain. Uh, pronator can be a cause of elbow pain. Uh, upper trap scalenes can be a cause of neck pain, can get really gritty, tight on throwers. And then just taking care of your posterior cuff uh, tissue quality. Uh, again, those, can, those are all just common spots that you're really gonna wanna make sure you're taking care of, especially if you've had any sort of nagging mobility issues or arm pain or neck pain or back pain. Uh, again, just make sure you get assessed and you know exactly what you're doing and what your deficiencies are from a mobility standpoint so you can make the most of the next uh, foreseeable future. All right, so what about from a speed and conditioning standpoint? Well, this is one that shouldn't really change much for most of you guys because, again, we're talking about sprinting variations. Uh, you can do hill sprints, you can do stair sprints, um, you can do loaded pushes. Uh, I've seen car pushes uh, done as kind of a sled variation. If you do have something, you can kind of create your own sled. I used to do tire, tire sled drags in high school. Uh, in my backyard, that worked great. Um, you can do bike intervals if you have a stationary bike. You can do treadmill intervals uh, if you have a treadmill. So there's a lot of different options from a speed and conditioning standpoint. Um, again, not that that's the highest priority for a lot of you guys uh, as throwers, but again, that still should be in your weekly uh, training cycle. So that isn't something that should change much based on equipment availability. And then finally, I wanna make a note on nutrition. So uh, if you are in a period where you're have, having to train in kind of a maintenance load, you're not able to necessarily uh, do everything that you, you were able to do in the past or train at that, near that same capacity. Um, and this goes for most of you guys who were already in season anyway. You should be eating in a caloric maintenance. So don't be trying to put on a ton of muscle mass in this period of time. And if you're trying to cut body fat or lose weight, uh, again, it might not be the best idea to try to cut 10 pounds in the next four weeks if your training stimulus isn't gonna be sufficiently strong. So look at this next period, however long it ends up being, as kind of a maintenance, uh, a maintenance time for as far as nutrition, where you're eating in maintenance calories, focusing on, on good food quality, um, you know, and focusing on good sleep quality as well. But again, the main point here is if you are able to kind of organize a good training program, you shouldn't have a problem with losing strength. If you lose a couple percentage on your strength, it's not gonna matter, it's gonna come back very quickly. But again, hopefully this gave you guys some ideas. And I, I will make sure to link a PDF down below uh, so that you guys can kind of print that out and follow it and have something to, to go to uh, to address all these questions we've been getting. Uh, that being said, guys, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to uh, subscribe to us on Twitter at Tread Athletics. 
Uh, make sure to like this video if you're watching it on YouTube and subscribe to us there. And again, if you guys need help with any of your training, uh, we are a remote training company. That's what we do. That's what we believe in. This is all we, all we think about all day is how to train pitchers, how to improve their bodies, how to improve velocity, arm care, all this good stuff. So we've worked with over 650 pitchers now since 2015. We've had over 27 athletes drafted since 2017 alone. Uh, so again, this is what we do. If you're kind of stuck in your own training, you're not sure what to do, or you want a more customized program in this interim, uh, make sure to email us at contact.treadathletics.com and we'll get you taken care of.